Welcome to the Massachusetts School of Law Educational Forum. Thanks for joining us today. The topic for today's show is Defending Justice, a look at military experience, education, and the law. I am Michael L. Coyne, the Associate Dean of the Massachusetts School of Law and your co-host for today's show. Joining us in our first segment is my co-host, Assistant Dean Diane Sullivan of the Massachusetts School of Law and Gary Wheaton, a student at the Massachusetts School of Law and retired military. At a very young age, I, I realized that I did want to go to the military. Um, probably the second reason why I went there is because I knew I needed the discipline personally. Um, grew up in a rough neighborhood and uh, figured if I went to state school, I probably wouldn't thrive as much. So I um, decided to go to Norwich. I did little investigations. I was also not a uh, U.S. citizen at the time, so the, the, the academies were out of the question, even if I was academically qualified, um, which I probably wasn't. But, <laughs> but I did, did work my way through the last portion of my high school to make sure I got into college. Uh, decided to go there because at the time they were giving um, one of the largest Air Force ROTC detachments in the country, probably the second largest and at times the largest. Um, so they had uh, the most pilot slots, which is what I was striving for at the time. Worked my butt off when I, once I got there and was awarded a pilot slot. Went to Air Force pilot training. Uh, flew jets for about a year and then um, they decided, the Air Force in their infinite wisdom, decided I was better behind a desk, I think. Uh, <laughs> for various reasons that would make it a long story, but I won't go there. Um, and I was a, an executive uh, officer. I was a, basically a general's aide for, for a few years there. and. Um, Went into the uh, Air Force Reserves after that, after my active duty stint in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. And then um, uh, go kind of kind of circles back to Norwich because I was at an alumni weekend uh, several years later and um, a bunch of my alumni soccer friends were uh, involved in a mountain cold weather army unit in Vermont. And they talked me into switching branches. Um, so I also uh, did a stint in the Army National Guard in Vermont. It was a mountain cold weather training school. Um, we trained principally special forces off, you know, uh, operators in the winter and summer phases of uh, mountain warfare training. We also trained uh, regular infantry from Fort Drum, a mountain unit out there. So, so I did that for a lot of years um, and then uh, used up my time and became old and too old to be used and now I'm a civilian. My dad actually used to spend two weeks a year training up at Fort Drum. I didn't even realize that it was still operational, so good to hear. It's interesting because they're probably one of the most active units in the military. They, they've been activated to Iraq several times. They've been activated to Afghanistan many times, and um, probably because of their light infantry mountain training, so they're very versatile. Have you ever been uh, sent to any areas of combat or conflict? The first Persian Gulf War in 1990, we were escalated. We were basically on an airplane and when the Kurds were getting into trouble afterwards, um, that was our conus as far as mountain infantry and that type of thing. But we never actually landed in, in, in country. We stayed in Germany and came back. You've had um, experience with two different branches of the military with a private contractor. How do you end up in law school? Uh, you know, ever since I was a little kid, I figured I'd be in the military the rest of my life. Of course, that plan doesn't always work. Um, and I, I, you know, to this day, quite honestly, I, I never wanted to be a lawyer. Um, I don't know that I'm definitely going to be a lawyer. Um, it's, it's, it's definitely certainly an option for me at this time, uh, being starting my third year. Um, but I, I had a pretty decent business career up until till recently and the economy went south um, and I got distracted with some politics and some things like that and uh, somebody just mentioned it to me. They were like, you know, you'd probably be a good lawyer, you know, you should check out this school in Massachusetts. They do a real nice job. You don't have to take the LSATs and all that stuff. And at my age, I wasn't going to start over and do all that kind of thing. So I looked at it just out of curiosity, to be honest with you. and. Um, you know, didn't have a lot of confidence in my writing abilities and, and certainly my reading skills, so I said, yeah, it might not be the right place for me. But as I spoke to a few people here, um, and as I investigated it further, it kind of sucked me in. The idea sucked me in, um, the, the philosophy of the school, um, some of the other things that you guys were doing that I thought were very unique and, and fit me well. Location was perfect because I lived 20 minutes away. Um, price was certainly a, a key issue um, as far as being low cost. That's important at my age again. Um, and, you know, quite frankly, I figured why not give it a try and if I make it through the first semester, so be it. And I 
honestly didn't think I had a chance to make it through the first semester. But once I got here, I found it that to be not only very interesting, but interesting enough that I would study the material and work hard at the material. And um, I'm still here four, four semesters later. So Congratulations on that. Countless opportunities. Your future is wide open. Great decision. You can do so many things with your law degree. Absolutely. So which, which is harder, law school or military life? Well, I'll tell you, you know, pilot training was probably, uh, up until now, it was probably the most difficult thing I ever succeeded in. It was um, certainly 12-hour days of very, very brutal and very difficult conditions, you know, physically and mentally. Um, they told us that going in, that it would be like getting a, a graduate degree plus in less than a year and that kind of thing. Uh, so it was extremely difficult. Um, law school has measured up to the difficulty challenge. I remember um, working full-time when I started here and um, going through the basic uh, coursework of the first and second semester as well, and even into the third semester with con law, and that, that semester was extremely difficult as well, um, trying to balance the, the, the work and the life and the, 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 the trying to make a living to keep the house and all that good stuff, extremely, extremely difficult and challenging. However, as they say, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So um, I, I think I equate the experience very, very similarly. So many of our students that are in class, um, you're not 23 years old, obviously. Sorry, sorry that I say that on air, Noticed Gary. That, didn't <laughs> <you>? yeah. <laughs> How do you believe your years in the military and that experience makes you different to other law students, or are you really very similar? I firmly believe in my particular situation, had I not gone to Norwich University, which is a very good school, that gave me that discipline, that work ethic, and those things at a very early age in life. I probably would not be successful now. In my particular situation, I wasn't sure I wanted law school. So it was like, it was one of those things of, of a striving for excellence. If you're going to try something, if you're going to do something, even, even if you might not want it that bad, you still got to do your best. You still got to try your best. There's no halfway, that kind of thing. So that, that, that uh, mantra, if you will, came from the military for sure. Um, I'm sure that other students here have other drivers, maybe they've wanted to be a lawyer since a very early age and they have the passion, for example, that I'm trying to develop for the, for the law. Um, <laughs> and, and, and in some cases it's starting, um, but again, like you said, um, this, whether I pursue the law, law as a profession or not, it's still going to open up a lot of doors as far as my business career. So, but I guess to answer your question more succinctly, I don't know if it makes me any different. Um, I know that I have a lot of discipline, a lot of focus ability. Um, I'm very goal oriented and I have some of those skills that the military certainly taught me. I'm assuming some of the civilians can get that in other ways. Well, I joined the, uh, the Navy right out of the high school. Um, I got an appointment to the Naval Academy from my congressman. Competitive uh, appointment, so it was not not uh, a political appointment, but of course all, all are political in some sense. But uh, that was 1968. The uh, Vietnam War was, uh, was raging at the time, and uh, uh, I joined uh, not to avoid the, the uh, service in the Army, but uh, because I wanted, to, uh, I wanted to do something in the military, and the Navy was uh, family tradition. My father was a, a uh, commander in the Naval Reserves, uh, had served in World War II, and uh, so it was an opportunity for me to continue the, the uh, family tradition, so to speak, and uh, um, I've never regretted it. It's been uh, it's a wonderful experience. So how many degrees have you obtained since your, during in your military service? Well, I was very, very fortunate. Uh, while I was at the Naval Academy, I was selected as a Trident Scholar, so I spent my last year at, uh, at the Academy uh, doing basically research. I finished my, my bachelor's degree in three years, they had nothing else to do with me, so they kept me on. A, uh, they wouldn't graduate me because uh, you got to go through four years uh, at the academy. So they, they uh, allowed me to do research and then um, gave me what was called an IGEP, an immediate graduate education program scholarship to MIT for a master's degree in ocean engineering. Um, subsequent to that, uh, I did a tour as an uh, instructor teaching celestial navigation at Notre Dame. And while there, picked up two master's degrees, one from Notre Dame, one from Indiana University in business administration and, and public administration. Um, they then sent me uh, later on to the Naval War College uh, at Newport, Rhode Island, where uh, I earned a degree in uh, Master of Arts in International, well, I'm sorry, in National Security Policy and Decision Making. Um, so the Navy paid for essentially four master's degrees uh, uh, as part of my service. 
The only one they didn't pay for is your law degree. Well, actually, uh, <laughs> after, after I, I uh, left the Navy, I went back to school to get a master's uh, from the uh, University of uh, South Florida in, uh, in Tampa in management information systems. And they said it was crazy to get a fifth master's degree. Uh, I should stick around and get a doctorate, so I did, in information systems, decision sciences. And then subsequent to that, uh, decided I really wanted to go back to school and, and go to law school. And, uh, um, and here I am. <laughs> you know, that seems to be a pretty common thread through a lot of our discussions with the veterans is that uh, the military has provided an incredible amount of educational opportunities for its uh, members. The branch of service I was in was, was the Nuclear Submarine Force. And of course, Admiral Rickover was uh, renowned as an education advocate. Uh, his education programs, uh, I, I believe, are among the finest in the world. I mean, he takes um, literally kids right out of high school, and by the time uh, he's had them for a year, they, they have a degree, equivalent of a degree, in nuclear engineering. Uh, these are very, very um, well-trained, sharp kids. Uh, kids, that, I mean, 19, 20 years old, and they're running uh, nuclear reactors. Mm -hmm. um, uh, a very, very rigorous program, uh, but you can't go through that program without uh, instilling in you a, a sense that education is, uh, is something to be valued uh, uh, more than anything else. And tell me a little bit specifically about your service, uh, especially towards the end. What were your duties? So after MIT, I went straight uh, from Cambridge, uh, drove cross country out to uh, Mare Island, uh, in California, Vallejo, California, to start nuclear power school. Um, and that began uh, 20, 20 some years uh, in nuclear submarines. Uh, and that's, you start out as a division officer. I was a main propulsion assistant, communications officer. Um, subsequent tour was a navigation officer uh, um, on a ballistic missile submarine. Uh, then two tours as executive officer, the second in command of the ship, uh, one on a, a uh, um, overhaul of the USS John Marshall, uh, converting it to a SEAL team carrying vessel, and one on Skipjack, which is a uh, 585 class fast attack. And then uh, tours commanding officer of USS Ray, which is a Sturgeon class 637 short hull uh, fast attack, uh, which uh, I have to say is it's absolutely the best job in the world. Uh, Why? Just because it is one of the very, very few jobs in the world that you are completely autonomous, certainly in the military. When you think about an aircraft carrier, um, it's in constant communications. Uh, you've got the president sitting back in the situation room, monitoring uh, his every move. I mean, he can actually pick up a telephone and give commanding officer an order to turn right or turn left or launch weapons or whatnot. A submarine, you go off on a special operation, you literally pull the plugs on all of your transmitting equipment. And so you can't transmit anything. All you can do is receive. So they don't know where you are, what you're doing, what your situation is. They can't give you orders. So literally, um, you spend several weeks ahead of time talking to the fleet commander, the submarine force commander, uh, and uh, getting your marching orders. And they basically are, go forth and do good in the name of the king. Uh, very similar to, to the uh, uh, wooden chip uh, days uh, that, uh, where you'd be out of communication for two years at a time. So um, there's just a sense when you, you, st you steam down the river and uh, you pull the hatch shut, you, you dive, you're on your own. Uh, and, and that is a, an incredible responsibility, but, but uh, um, it's an, it, there's just no other feeling like it. So you've been a commander, commander of a nuclear submarine, you've been a professor at various places, mm -hmm. and then law school. Why, why did you decide you wanted to go into law school? I, I've always had a, a fascination with the law. I'm not, not particularly interested in being a lawyer per mm -hmm. se, but I've been fascinated with the law and, and what the, the, uh, the apparent um, paradox of, of a system designed for justice in which justice so rarely seems to actually happen. Uh, why is that? Uh, there had to be something, some structural underlying reason for it that I did not understand. Mm -hmm. and, and so, um, as with, with anything else, if you don't understand, you got to go do some research and find out. And so, uh, I spent three and a half years uh, finding that it, it was, in fact, a lack of understanding on my part what the system was for and how it was, it was supposed to work as to why it, it 
apparently didn't seem to work uh, like I thought it should. And now after graduating law school, you've just recently completed, passed the bar, uh, you're going to use your legal skills to help uh, veterans. Well, right now I'm, I'm legal counsel for the uh, USS Thresher um, Arlington National Cemetery Memorial Foundation, which is a, uh, uh, was soon to be a 501c3 corporation set up to uh, build a memorial in Arlington National Cemetery uh, to honor the 129 men of the Thresher who, who died in April 1963. I'm looking uh, to work with the uh, Veterans of Foreign Wars who are setting up a veterans legal uh, project uh, to try to assist uh, vets coming back specifically from Afghanistan and Iraq who have some, some pretty serious uh, post-service problems adapting, um, whether it's PTSD or, or uh, um, traumatic brain injury or, or uh, simply the, the stresses of, uh, of a combat separation on a family. Uh, a lot of guys come back and they've got either family problems, they've got uh, foreclosure problems, they've got sometimes they get in trouble with the, uh, with the criminal law. Uh, there's not a lot of help for those guys. Um, because most of the, the legal assistance that's set up is, is targeted at getting VA benefits mm -hmm. you know, for the Veterans Administration. It's not really set up to handle their civil difficulties. Those are assumed to be their, their problem. And, uh, but in fact, a lot of it stems from their service. Yeah, a disturbing statistic that we uh, frequently are made aware of is that very large uh, percentage of homeless uh, individuals are our former veterans. And it seems like we could provide um, greater services so that that doesn't have to happen more often. Obviously the, the unemployment rate is much higher for, for uh, returning vets. Uh, the homeless uh, um, uh, numbers are going to follow that. Uh, if you're unemployed you're going to have a hard time um, uh, staying in a house. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure that the answer necessarily is, is government um, programs, uh, but I do think that we as a society do owe much more uh, in the way of understanding and, and uh, a hand uh, to, to help them out. Are there skills that you acquired in the military that you think ha were helpful in law school and will be helpful as a lawyer in order to help uh, veterans and others in your law practice? It's a little difficult to be a nuclear engineer without being rather focused. <laughs> <laughs> I hope. <laughs> uh, the, the, uh, it's a very detail-oriented uh, profession. Um, uh, the idea of questioning everything, to, to look at uh, the underlying assumptions and principles and, and to, uh, to really get to the, to the basics. Um, that was, was uh, all coming out of nuclear power school. Mm -hmm. um, that was something stressed uh, from the get-go to, uh, to understand, yeah, you could use thumb rules later on, you could um, uh, use you know, estimates and, and they very strongly encourage you to to make rough estimates, always to check the situation, but you, you understood what the underlying principles were that you were, you were estimating. Mm -hmm. uh, you had to have that very firm foundation that you could uh, uh, then depart from if you had to. I always enjoyed having you in <laughs> class, John, and, uh, and I did like, and I do think it's important to question everything um, and to really think harder about the, what the questions are likely to follow, and, and, and that's, that's hopefully will get us closer to the truth of the thing, of mm -hmm. the matter. I joined the Army National Guard uh, for a six-year commitment, uh, whereupon I served um, a six-month tour in Operation Desert Shield, Desert Storm. Now, what was it that brought you to the military? Were you searching for money, or were your family members part of the military? I mean, women of our age didn't join the military in those days, so I'm intrigued by why you went in. I was 17 and actually had enough credits to graduate high school early. Um, so my friends were still in school and I left for basic training. Um, my mother was a Marine wow. back in Korea and my father was in the U.S. Uh, Navy. So both of your parents were in the military and this was a part of your family life? A little bit. Um, I have three older sisters and it was actually outside of the box. It was doing something different than the rest of the family, okay. really. How do you feel that you benefited, if in fact you did benefit from your military years? I believe everything I learned as far as time management skills, mm -hmm. organizational skills, discipline, 
they've all helped me up until this point um, throughout my military career, throughout um, my, uh, my career, law enforcement career, and up until now, into law school. Tell me a little bit about your law enforcement career. What are you doing now, Jody? I've been in law enforcement for about 18 years now. Mm -hmm. Good for you. And now you're in law school. Tell me about the decision to come to law school. I've always wanted to since I was young, but uh, younger. And um, it was just one more thing that I needed to accomplish. Just the knowledge, having the knowledge, learning the knowledge. Is, I can never get enough knowledge to, um, it helps me in my career, it helps me in my personal life, and my family life. Well, as you know, here at the law school, we have a number of individuals with law enforcement backgrounds who have always uh, had an interest in going on to law school. So it's wonderful to have you as students. You really add to the class. What do you hope to do with your law degree? That I do not know mm -hmm. um, at this point. Uh, just ascertaining it right now, the, the whole challenge, the process is, is the challenge. Sure. And um, just being... Uh, I'm grateful just to have the opportunity to be here, really. I, I don't know if I'm going to practice, but it helps in all facets of my life. We've had a number of police officers come through law school, and now many of them have ended up as chief of police. But on the other hand, we've had a number of police officers who have also decided when they retire from police work to go on and set up a practice. So I guess it gives a lot of opportunities to somebody who decides to take advantage of a law degree. Do you see yourself, because of your military years, in any way different than you see the law students that surround you? In other words, being in the military, has that changed you in a way that other folks um, don't have those similar characteristics? That I do not know. I can see myself being able to go through the program, go through Mass School of Law, having the military experience because it's given me those skills as I said that the time management prioritizing mm -hmm. um, juggling family school work all these things I'm able to prioritize because of those skills I learned in the military but do I see myself different from the person sitting next to me that's a lot younger <laughs> and that may not have served uh, in the military that I don't know I, you know that that's a tough question to answer You know, tradition, I like to think my grandfather was in the Navy. Um, he served during the Korean War. But then um, as I was moving towards graduation, I went, I went to St. Anselm College where I got my undergraduate. Um, as important as a degree is, you needed experience, you know, to especially do the field I wanted to do, which was police work at the time. I majored in criminal justice. So I needed experience, and I thought, what better way to get it than going into the Navy? and I was a uh, master at arm, which is basically a police officer, military police. So after graduating college, or virtually immediately after graduating college, you entered the, the Navy? I was searching for jobs around here, working you know, in a police job and things like that, but uh, it didn't work out, so I, I decided to go into the Navy. Now, how long were you in the service? I was in the service for five years. And wh where did you serve in that period? That's kind of a funny story. When you when you think about the Navy, I remember in boot camp, they're like, for those of you who are dreaming of going to Europe or being stationed there, you know, dream on, you're going to be on a ship, you know, somewhere in the ocean. I was fortunate enough, my first tour was in Bahrain, in the capital, Al-Manama. I, I lived off base, and, you know, that was my first real exposure to an Arabic country. It's off the coast of Saudi Arabia. And... Right now, it's you know there's been a lot of violence there and protests, so people are more familiar with it. But after that was where it got really difficult for me. I got to spend my rest of my time in the military in the south of Spain. <laughs> yeah. So I I literally lived on the beach in the south of Spain. Um, I was stationed in Rota, Spain, for four years on a joint base, a Spanish American base. So it was a it was a great five years. Yeah, uh, sounds like it's an ad for join the Navy and uh, see the world. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> so. Now, did you pursue higher education while uh, in the Navy as well? They afford you a lot of opportunities. Um, they have local education on base where, you know, University, I think, of Texas and things like that. Um, they offer a lot of those classes for you. 
I ended up getting a master's degree in security management from American Military University, which was funded totally by the military while I was in. So the military funded your master's degree? Yes. And also, to, to some extent, uh, you were able to complete it dis uh, despite being full-time in the military as well while, while yes, in Spain? So yes. So it was a great opportunity. Um, I also came under a program called the R uh, LERP, they call it, the Loan Repayment Program, where they pay a sort, certain portion of your student loans back. Mm -hmm. The federally granted student loans, they pay those back. So I also had a portion of my undergraduate um, tuition paid for. Yeah, the recurring theme here seems to be that the, the military is incredibly supportive of higher education. Oh, without a doubt. And I think, you know, it attracts more people. And I mean, when you think about other countries like Israel where they're conscripted into the military, it's, it's an all-volunteer military. And, you know, what I consider to be the greatest military in the world. So when they offer benefits like that, I think they get a lot of, you know, people they're looking for and, you know, more diverse background. But it offers some unique benefits for military service members. So then after five years, you decided it was time to, to move on. Yes. Uh, and then at some point, you decided law school was in the future as well. How did, how did that come about? How, why did you end up in law school after this period of time? After the military, I started working for a government contractor, um, doing mostly stuff related to my military experience. And um, it wasn't really what I wanted to do, and I didn't see a future in that. Um, I met someone there who had attended Massachusetts School of Law, and I from my undergraduate experience, I, I thought I had a knack for doing some of the legal work and he kind of mentored me and pushed me in the direction of attending law school. Which do you think prepared you better at least for the uh, beginning of law school, the military or your, your undergrad and master's degrees? And I know your, your undergraduate institution, uh, St. A's, is known as preparing students uh, rigorously and well for uh, graduate programs. I joke with my wife. Um, Law school is the easiest part of my day. I'm, you know, raising <laughs> kids. I, I, I don't, <laughs> you know, I, certainly anyone who stays home and raises a family is certainly difficult. I just, I, not to oversimplify it, but even in the military, I just had, you know, simple keys to success. I mean, for the military, it was, it was relatively small. You shave, you iron your uniform, and you polish your boots, and you're ahead of the game, you know. Then you, you don't get bothered. And in law school, you do your cases, and you're prepared for class you know, you don't get bothered, so, <laughs> so I just simplified it all, you know, and I don't want to oversimplify no. it, but I'm just saying I have small keys that if you do those things, then it, it's easy to accomplish your goals, but um, the thing about it is I think not necessarily the military, but life and experience in general, you know, when you're, um, there's, you know, people who go to college and then come right to law school, they, I think, you know, MSL offers a different, you know, people with different backgrounds and some people are older or they've had life experience, but it offers something unique. So um, it, it's easier. I'm not saying it's easier to study, but I mean, I've done other things where this isn't so overwhelming for me and I'm, you know, not young as I used to be anymore, but. Work smarter, not faster yeah. these days. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now tell me, how do you think that, how well prepared you were to compete against the students in law school? Because uh, some people would say, well, when you've been out of school a while, it's a little difficult. You've got to juggle the three kids, uh, uh, and I've got, to, I've got to work a little bit. I mean, you have a lot more draws on your time than um, sort of the traditional 20-year-old college student or the 23-year-old law school student. It's just a lot of time management. You know, when can you get your things done? You know, if you know your child has a soccer game and you want to attend it, you have to be able to be like, well, what, what do I have coming up next week that I need to get done? And mm -hmm. I've tried to live by just managing my time wisely and being able to accomplish stuff so I won't have to do it when I actually have something pressing to do. A lot of uh, education is time management, and you probably have some ability to, to acquire that skill in um, the military as well. Of course, they're managing a lot of your time <laughs> there, I'm sure. Yes, <laughs> definitely. What do you hope to accomplish uh, with your law school degree and your legal training? I hope to probably um, go mostly into criminal. You still like that law enforcement stuff? I do. I mean, and that's my background. I, I, I mean, my father was a police officer, and my, my mother says, how could you do that? <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a foundation of our entire legal system. You know, that's what I tell her. But I think that every professor here will tell you, you're not sure even the, even the, 
person who's like entirely sure they're going to do something in law school. I've and I've encountered classes that I never thought that I would enjoy, you know, torts and negligence and things like that. So I could see myself moving into, you know, personal injury and things like that. I never, you know, thought thought of that before. So it's always keep an open mind. I had a, a young woman who was a, uh, we'll say, a super liberal, bleeding heart, now who now prosecutes for the district attorney's office and, and loves every minute of it. So, so life takes its twists and turns. You never know. You never know. What ways do you think your military service changed you? Well, I was 23 or 24 when I joined the military. I'd already been to college. So, you know, there were some kids who, uh, you know, just barely turned 18. Um, I like to think that it didn't change me in a lot of ways. I was who I was. I like to think it more expanded my understanding of things. I got to, you know, work with a lot of different people from a lot of different places. I think it just built me up more to who I am now instead of changing me. How old are you now? I'm 32. And probably 22 at college graduation, thereabouts? Yes. So are you a better law student at 32 than you would have been at 22? Yes, uh, definitely. Why do you say that? Because I was young and naive, I, I could do it without really trying, I guess. And now when you have a goal set in mind, I, it's, just, it, it's just a totally different mentality. I mean, when I was in my undergraduate, I did what I needed to do to pass, you know, and right. then I moved on. So I wasn't, you know, particularly in the, the person you'd see in the library on a Friday night. But now that I'm older and I'm more experienced and I have a family to worry about, I have uh, more purpose and it makes it easier. You know, we see that over and over again is that um, students uh, find their purpose, their mission when they get to law school. I know how well you're doing here and uh, how hard you work at uh, achieving good grades. And uh, I think part of it is maturity, part of it maybe is you're carrying a little more of the freight yourself now instead of mom and dad. But I also think uh, having real responsibilities to, to those around you means that you've got to uh, take it a little more seriously sometimes as well. Definitely. So uh, Leaving here, uh, if it's not law enforcement or if it's not the district attorney's office or defending criminal, uh, uh, those accused of criminal charges, is there some, some other big wish list uh, item or just a small wish list item that you might have in mind? I think I've done things on my own. My, my wife immigrated to this country. She's did you meet her in the military? I met her in the military in Spain, so... Another, another benefit of the military. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I actually, and, you know, I took Spanish in college, but I learned, you know, to speak Spanish fluently when I was in Spain, because that's how my wife communicated. She didn't speak English when I met her. And um, my wife speaks five languages now, so she's, uh, she's quite amazing. But Impressive. I would like to think that maybe I prepared every step of the immigration process myself, so I'd like to think that maybe Someday that might be something I could look into is helping someone trying to go through the immigration process. Or um, right now I serve in Fort Jackson here in Massachusetts and I'm in the Army Reserve. You are a full-time student and then you yep. every, every, weekend, mm -hmm. every weekend, once a month you go in for active reserve training, is yep. that correct? Well, like they say, you're always a full-time soldier and a full-time civilian but once a month. Mm -hmm. Let's turn back the clock a little bit and tell me what decisions impacted you that made you join the military? Was it for money? Was it because you had family members that were in the service or do you like being in groups? What motivated you to join? I would like to say that it was to serve my country because, and actually a small part of it it was, but mostly it was financial. I had just came out of my undergrad and I had tons of student loans and the only way that I would go to law school and come here was to join the military. So that was my biggest incentive, financial reasons. So the military offers some kind of incentive with respect to your student loans if a young person were to join the military that yeah. you want to take mm -hmm. advantage of? Correct. They offer two options. One option, if you already went on undergrad, they would pay all your undergrad loans up to 20000 Or if you just started your college experience, they would pay for your college up to four years. So in your experience, do you believe a lot of young people are joining the military to take advantage of these educational benefits? Tons of people. Most of the people that I went to basic training with was that reason. It's financial. 
Putting aside the monetary benefits of the military, tell me some of the other ways you feel that you benefited from your service time. Well, when I went to basic training, I was just astonished as how much patriotism people actually have. And I have met such wonderful people, battle buddies of mine, that are going to be my friends for my whole entire life. And just the experience that you have going through somebody and through basic training and doing difficult stuff, and you just build a sense of like, oh my God, I'm doing something for other people, for my country. It's a good, it's a good feeling, and I'll, I'll never regret it. What role do you play in the Army Reserve? Well, I'm a 42 Alpha, which means I'm a human resource specialist which means that I work with people's pay, getting people promoted, um, when people want to get out of the Army or come into the Army, I basically handle all their paperwork. When you get awards in the Army, I make sure I do them, make sure that all the commanders sign, all that, all that stuff, that's what I deal with. Have you been deployed? We have been locally deployed. We have been to Fort Jackson, Fort Bragg, Fort McCoy, and one time we went to Kuwait, but it was for a slight, like, couple of days, and then we came back. Do you anticipate in your future that you might serve combat time? Well, my company right now, it's on what we call a fifth year, which means that for a whole entire year, we have a 50-50 chance of getting deployed. They pick two companies, so my, our company and another company, and from May to May, they could call us up at any time. Okay, now you are a law student. I am. And so what happens if you get the call that you're deploying? You've got to serve your country because that's what you signed up for. And then when you come back, you would pick up and finish up your law degree. That's the plan. Wow. Scary. Do you worry about it? Do you worry about when you have All a con law exam, for example, All that, oh my goodness, I might get that call? All the time. Yeah. All the time. But that's just something that you have to live with. And you have to live with that when you have a final exam and you have to go to drill on a four-day weekend and mm -hmm. you have to study. It's hard, but you just do it. What do you hope to do with your legal training when you graduate from the Mass School of Law? Originally, after going through the Army, I wanted to be a JAG lawyer. That's what I wanted to be, but now I like criminal law. I really enjoy criminal law. After being part of the mock trial team and having that experience in a courtroom, I really enjoy it. Well, soldiers defend us, and we say that lawyers protect our rights and defend Collide. us as well, so I can see the similarity. Mm -hmm. um, do you believe that you are different than the other law students that you sit with in classes because of your military service, or do you think you're just like the other law students? I guess I would say I'm just like the others because I have the same worries, like do I study for an exam, how much do I study, how much time do I spend with my family, but it's a little bit different in the fact that in the back of my head you're always a full-time soldier and at any point your commander can call you, hey I need this for you, in a weekend I have to be out of commission for a whole weekend and not think about law school and, and usually in the weekends that's when you have time to catch up with your lectures, time to do your homework, so it's a little bit different and even more the army teaches you to be a little bit more meticulous about the stuff that you do. And in That's the a good thing. Yeah, and even in the Army, everything is acronym. Everything is an acronym in the Army. So I apply that to when I study. I make everything into an acronym. So every time that I need to remember something, I have acronyms for absolutely everything, and that's thanks to the Army. So how do you believe that you have personally benefited from your military service? It makes me a little bit more meticulous, and I have a more of an appreciation for the military and for the people that are soldiers and police officers and firefighters. It takes a special person to put everything to the side and to do something that you committed yourself to. And how are you benefiting and combining that with your experience here at MSL? In my work habit, I think it shows and it's thanks to the military because they build that work habit in the military and I think it reflects on the stuff that I do in MSL. Uh, education has been a very part, a very important part of my family. Thus, I needed a way to help uh, fund that. So I looked at the military and what it offered, not only monetarily, but the values and, 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 the, uh, and the discipline that it's instilled in the military uh, members. Now, how long have you been a, a member of the service at this point? I've been in for seven years now. And what do you do uh, within the Air Force? I work with electronic systems, say like that. Uh, you said that it was important from the standpoint of both furthering your education and providing the discipline. How does it provide the discipline that, that helps further your education? It helps me to stay focused on my, my, my goals at hand. Um, uh, unlike a lot of my uh, other classmates, you know, some people don't come with that, come to the classroom with that di sort of discipline. And I felt like the Air Force was that, was that uh, 
was the thing that helped me to focus on the on what I wanted in the future. Have you been in the Air Force throughout college as well as your uh, period in law school? Yes, sir. Oh, okay, so you, you were actually in the Air Force before you started college? Yes, sir. So you've been pursuing both of these uh, tracks simultaneously, the yes, Air Force as well as the college and now law school? Yes, sir. How did it help you complete college? Overall, the Air Force has allowed me to obtain uh, three college degrees thus far before even coming to law school. You, you have two other degrees in addition to? Yes, sir. Three. Yes, sir. And what were your majors? I double majored. I uh, went to university. I majored in pre-law. I majored in corporate finance. And at the third degree was through the Air Force, was in um, electrical systems, electrical engineering. That sounds like an incredible amount of work in the, for a relatively young man in a brief period of time, yes, sir. in addition to your military service. Yes, sir. It is. It is. It, it's a lot of work. But as I said, I myself, I wanted to accomplish these things. Um, prior to really going into the military. Like I said, the military provided me with that discipline in order to make that happen. And so now I, I transfer that into my law school career and I, I see the benefits of actually being, uh, being here and being in uh, the military as well. Um, I'm from South Carolina originally, so. Yeah, that accent didn't sound local. No, sir. <laughs> you know, being away from my family for so a long period of time, I kind of get homesick. So the military in itself, uh, I'm still in, in in the military, but they provide that second family, mm -hmm. you know, that I that I can go and confide in and talk to when when the rigors of law school kind of get to you. So you know, and they they encourage me, um, they encourage me at the um, to the utmost, and they really want to see me succeed. Uh, in the Air Force, our core values are uh, integrity first service before self and excellence in all we do. And when I come through the doors of MSL every day, I kind of wear that as well. You know, integrity, try to, you know, always be honest in everything, uh, service to the community before yourself, and in excellence, in which, you know, MSL, uh, it requires from its students. Well, and you exemplify those qualities to a very high degree. I, whether it's your parents or the Air Force that are responsible, I'm proud that you're part of our institution as well. Mm -hmm. Let, talk to me a little bit about that from the standpoint of having so mu done so much already, obtained your various degrees, and the discipline that the Air Force has given you. How does that make you either very similar to other students that you are in the class or, or very different from the students that you see in your various classes that you have? I see myself as similar uh, uh, to the other students as well. Um, we all had to kind of go through something to get to this point, um, whether it be of our own personal endeavors or what have you. And, um, you know, the Air Force has um, helped shape me, shape my way of thinking to think forward, uh, be a forward-thinking person. You look at the next, uh, next objective, the next goal. And so I see myself, as many other law school students here see themselves, as someone who's forward-thinking who's looking towards the future. You know, you wouldn't really be here if you weren't someone who was looking towards uh, actually getting out there and practicing law or, or teaching or what have you. And I think that's terrific, but tell me, um, with respect to your law school career, I know already um, you, you've got a deployment coming up, you've had some interruptions. How do you balance being a pretty active uh, service person and uh, the various timing demands of, of attendance in law school and all the rest? Well, I mean, I've been doing it for so long, since undergrad, so I've been doing it for a while. I'm kind of used to it, if anything. Um, I mean, it's, it's what I signed up for. Um, it's what I, what I knew coming into MSL, and, you know, I was, I'm willing to make that sacrifice. Now, you're in the middle of your second year, is that about right? Yes, about sir. Right? Yeah. And you're not going to be returning for the uh, next semester because you've been deployed? I'm going to um, Kuwait. Uh, I won't be back until next summer. Does that concern you that you've got taking six months off from law school and then coming back in the fall semester or this is the way your program has been for seven or eight years now is that you balance both and keep your nose to the grindstone and keep working at it? I obviously don't want to be behind my uh, incoming class but you know I look at it, it it'll definitely help me uh, with the new GI Bill policy uh, that just came, uh, came about it'll definitely help me pay for school. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, other than that, it does really concern me, but at the same time, you know, I look at the end. 
I can't look at, you know, next semester, I look at what's coming in the end, and hopefully uh, that's graduation from this prestigious university. Now, the likelihood is you're going to take your final examinations not here in Andover, Mass., but somewhere overseas at this point. Yes, sir. What do you think of that? It's new. I haven't had to do that before, but, I mean, I don't have any problems with it. Um, I don't, <laughs> I don't know what to really think of that, but I mean, it, it's it's the same thing. I don't see it as any, being any different. Where where it, you know, taking an exam in your class or taking an exam and having one of my um, superiors mm -hmm. look over me, you know, as I take sit for that exam. So, same difference. You're not going to be able to play with either of us. No sir, <laughs> no sir. Tell me what you intend to do with your legal education, or is your law school education, from what it sounds, may not be the end of your. Uh, educational endeavors. What's the what's the plan after law school? My my interest has been more in uh, finance, um, in dealing with like corporate law, business law, um, uh, definitely practice, and and also at the same time, give back to my community. I'm not like I said before. I'm not originally from Massachusetts and South Carolina, and my community is is very important to me. You know, they have been the ones who have. Uh, instilled a lot of things in me and and got me to this point as well you know they've been my support system mm -hmm. um, so definitely giving back to my community as well as practicing uh, will be very important to me now whether I get to practice in uh, South Carolina I'm not sure but um, anywhere that I go I feel as though you know community will be a very big part of what I do which has changed you more to this point law school or your military service I think both have prepared me for for uh, uh, changed me up to, well prepared me up to this point. Um, I see you know the military is one of those things whereas I've been put in situations where I've had to think on my feet, just as you would do as a litigator, mm -hmm. as an attorney. You know I've been put in situations whereas I didn't really want to be you know the leader at that time, but when time you know when it, when that role is needs to be filled, then you know I have to tough step up and and, and take the uh, the leadership position. So, you know, I think that law school and the military has kind of been, has helped develop me. They've helped develop me simultaneously um, because, you know, as, as a litigator, you have to think on your feet. You often put in roles, whereas you have to be the leader because the client is looking to you in order to help them with their situation, you know. And so it, it's, it's one of those things, whereas they've been working hand in hand. Uh, you're always prepared for class. You're always engaged in the classroom discussion. Um, that that type of discipline and that type of dedication shows in your law school studies as well and I've always been impressed with your, your level of diligence. Um, is there the future in the uh, Air Force or in the service as well or is it at some point uh, would you see yourself more as dedicated to, to law and um, back to your community? Ideally when I came into the Air Force, my, 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 uh, like I said before, my, my concern was just trying to pay for college. But, the, but it's one of those things whereas you don't really see, you know, the, the benefits of it until you're into the program. Mm -hmm. And the Air Force has been very beneficial to me. So I, I can only, you know, give in return as they have given to me. And so I see that I will have to juggle both a, a, a military career and a legal career, but I do know that it's possible. Have you had much contact with other veterans uh, on campus or you tend to... Uh, do your job, come in, do your studies, and just keep moving around. They, we kind of share stories and et cetera, but um, at the same time, I do say to myself, you know, um, because I guess that's just me. What advice would you give for other uh, service people that might be considering uh, trying to either get their college degree or move on to law school or other graduate programs? I mean, because it has to be a daunting task. You, you make it look easy, but it's not always easy, obviously. I would definitely, you know, encourage that person who's willing to make the sacrifice uh, that law school requires, the time and, and the dedication that it requires to pursue a degree, uh, a high degree such as this. Um, it only has benefits. It only has benefits as I see. Uh, you know, it may seem like a daunting task initially, but at the same time, you have to look at the benefits in the end. You can't look at right now. I went into the Marine Corps in 1991 out of uh, Merrimack College. Uh, spent s just about six years on active duty and uh, read about 14 now in the reserves. Wow, congratulations and thank you. Tell me a little bit about what some of your missions might have been and what your role was in the military. I 
had a military specialty of uh, being a military policeman. Um, I went in as an officer, so some of my duties were to uh, oversee uh, a military police department, if you will, and over the course of time in different jobs, I was a general's aide for three years and I became an anti-terrorism uh, instructor later on down the road as well. Exciting work, interesting work. It, it is very exciting, something that I in 1998, when I went through the anti-terrorism course, it was something I didn't think I would use all that <laughs> often. And uh, lo and behold, I, I've certainly put those uh, skills to work. Now, tell me about your decision to leave the military and take us current to what your work occupation is today. I left the active ranks in uh, 1999. It was strictly to come back home to family. Um, it was to come back home to see my mother and father and be around my uh, sister as well. Um, looking back, sometimes I wish I had stayed on active duty, but it was a decision I can't go back on now. Um, I became a uh, local police officer and now I'm a state trooper with the, the state police here in Massachusetts. Tell us about your decision to come to the Massachusetts School of Law. What is it that a law degree represents for you? Educationally, probably the, the greatest degree that I could have personally obtained myself. Uh, similar to why I went into the Marine Corps, uh, I liked the uniforms and I wanted to see if I could meet the challenges that the Marine Corps would offer to me. Very similar to my desire to uh, obtain a law degree, to see if I had the uh, wherewithal to uh, go through the course and uh, achieve the degree. And you're doing terrific, as I can see firsthand. Thank you, Professor. Tell me what you plan to do with your law degree. How are you going to use that, assuming that you pass the bar exam? Are you going to stay with the police, or do you hope that someday, maybe in the far future, uh, to open your own law practice? A little bit of both. Ultimately, I really don't know. I, I hope to be able to give back in some capacity, and what that capacity is, I don't know yet. But I do plan to stay with the state police until I retire, and then uh, even while I'm on the state police, maybe get into an area of the law that I'm able to practice in uh, as I wind up towards retirement. Do you see yourself with your military experience as being different than a lot of the students in your class, or do you feel that you're very similar to everybody that's around you? I don't know that I would say different. I think some of the uh, life experiences that you get in the military and traveling around the world and seeing different cultures and folks who might be a little uh, worse off than you are might give you a different perspective. Uh, so from that perspective, from some of the younger students that, that may not have that, I, I don't know if it would be different, but just have different experiences. But in the same vein, some of the students that are younger in nature that sit next to us in class are far ahead of us with technology mm -hmm. and what they do with the technology aspects where I would be behind. What factors motivated you to join the military? Uh, honestly, it's to see if I could uh, to, to meet the challenges. The it Marine was Corps the had. challenge. It was to see if I could meet the challenge. Okay, I've heard a lot of other things. It was the money. It was because my family cared a lot about military life. But for the challenge of it, it was simply, that's a first. <laughs> simply to see if I could do it. I ran the marathon for Homes for Our Troops probably five years ago now. And I was just so touched by one quote that Travis Wood made. And he, I go, what do you miss most? You know, do you miss, you know, duck hunting? Do you miss, you know, the opportunity to, you know, run, run the marathon versus being in the wheelchair? He goes, oh, no. I, the thing that I miss most is fighting for my country. Mm -hmm. And I was so overwhelmed by that response because that's not what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it would be duck hunting or something like that or just being able to participate at leisure, you know versus, you know, hopping in and out of a chair or, you know, some of the other obstacles they have to overcome with. So I was impressed with the organization. I have a very strong military connection. My father served in the Navy for 30 years. My mother's a Marine. I have brothers-in-law who served in, in Vietnam and Iraq. And so it's a, I've seen the sacrifices they've made, and this was a good way for me to honor what they've done. And how successful has the program been? I think it's been successful in many ways, and I tell everyone on our committee, we focus on the cause, and the money and the contributions just take care of themselves. I mean, like last year, for example, when um, Josh Bouchard's mother and father came off the bus, and they saw, you know, 2,000 people, you know, big American flags, all this for their son, it, if we made no money, it would be worth it you know, just to show what we were doing for their son. And that is what's important about it, isn't it? I mean, that's why I know we wanted to help uh, support it and get involved, is that it's not just about raising money, it's about demonstrating that support. We're trying to show um, gratitude for those who are going to serve and those who are serving and those who ha have served. So we actually seize upon this event 
to call up all the vets, ROTC um, students down at BU. They come up and we honor them as part of the ceremony because it's, it's a great opportunity and, and they love the recognition because especially the Vietnam vets, I'm very sensitive to that because mm -hmm. my brother-in-law um, was a Vietnam vet and he still has some issues with that and some of these vets have never gotten thanked um, in a way I think they should so we just will we'll have a very elaborate ceremony that will be better than last year this year and we'll work on that with a company who, who loves the idea so we're having a tent for the vets ahead of time we're going to do this special ceremony bagpipes color guard the whole shooting works and the up on flatbed trucks and I think it's a, we, we can't thank them enough so this is you know we could thank them every day and it wouldn't be enough so when is the race uh, scheduled for well, the race is always the first Sunday and first weekend in, in April, and we like that because it's like two weeks before the Boston Marathon usually. So that's when it always is, and, it, and it's good because the people are tired of hibernating, <laughs> and so it's like the first major event as far as running and walking go in the area. It's a good fit, so it's like I said, it's so always the first Sunday that weekend in April. We're here in Andover. Yeah, right, right across the street. <laughs> yeah, so in that way it gives the soldiers and some of the volunteers who come from out of the area a chance to come and enjoy the dinner and for those who can't make one or the other it gives them an option and it kind of ties in the whole weekend so it's a real good fit and you know and both of them are very affordable and it's a good dinner and we'll have several guest speakers in fact um, Brad Campbell who was the general contractor for Josh's house out in Granby last year is going to come and speak because the entire house was built either through materials being donated or local fundraisers like this or ch and people donating their time and uh, I was out there for the key ceremony on January 12th and it was just everyone was just thrilled to be there and so it was great and let's talk a little bit about that specifically the funds and the resources and the donations that are received um, how does that support the, the our returning veterans well they build these houses that are specially adapted to, to the wheelchair situation and they're not like extreme makeover houses by any means, you know, <laughs> which I was happy to see because sometimes, you know, these charities and these can go over the top. But this was a very basic house. Everything was really accessible for them. And a lot of the times they contact, I, I'm not that familiar exactly the details on how to build the house, but a general contractor is, is, comes forward um, and he just calls upon his buddies and his favors. The plumbers are there, the electricians are there and they just it, it all happens it's an amazing and they have several of these going on all the time so even though the race and the dinner take place in april really you're gathering donations throughout the year for uh, services and goods and volunteer efforts and the like yeah we're focusing on kevin du bois who house will be built in coventry rhode island which is really neat because you know people can go down there and see the house being built and everything and i grew up kind of in, in north kingstown rhode island so it's somewhat you know, I drive down there a lot to see my mother, so I, I've actually already been to Coventry a couple of times and talked to some folks down there, and, and hopefully they'll come up like Josh's hometown did last year. If people want to donate either goods or services, money, or participate in the race of the walk, or um, come to dinner at the Wyndham in Andover, who, how would they contact Well, we uh, have your a website where all the information's on there. It's um, runforthetroops5k.com. All the information's on there. We do everything online there. There's actually photos and videos of the races from previous years um, and it's easy to do you, if you can't make any either one and you still like to donate you can there's a donate page on there also so and you can learn more about the event and you know Colonel Scott Brown this year is coming back out again and so uh, I saw that last year a number of our students are veterans a number of our professors participate as well in it uh, and it's a great uh, picture of uh, the senator with uh, various staff and students from here. And they were very proud uh, to be able to uh, be there with him on that day as well. And, uh, and plus, we've we got some exciting things to do again this year. We're doing camouflage shirts, which really dr drives home. It's, it's, a troop, it's about the troop. But we, you know, we can't do really do it without the seed money from the sponsors. And Massachusetts School of Law has been outstanding since day one. that's our show. We appreciate the time you spent with us today and thank you for watching. Thanks especially to all our branches of the United States military for their service in honor of this country. Semper Fi.